We've been here since the beginning of time. Our creation stories involve the lands and landscape here. We have teepee rings and ceremonial uh, structures that date back 10,000 years. Our world was tied to the land. We were the land and the land was us. It wasn't until after 1805 and the American Louisiana Purchase where they, in their minds, thought they bought this territory that was ours, that we began to have contact with the Americans. My great, great, great grandfather, his name was Wolf Calf. He was around 12 years old when he fought Meriwether Lewis. Captain Lewis and three of his best men encountered a group of our uh, Blackfeet teenagers. Captain Lewis told us through sign language that now the Americans were the new bosses in town and soon we're gonna be trading firearms to your enemies. So none of this was going over too well. And the boys whispered to themselves, let's pull off the coup of the century. Let's humble the Americans. And of course, when, what the young boys didn't know is they were dealing with some very skilled, military trained individuals. And in that battle, one of them was stabbed to death. And another one was shot in the back running away. This was an initial blood that was drawn by the Americans. There was no way we could have suspected that this first conflict incident would become the, not just a flood, a tsunami that would practically carry our people away. They beat us through germ warfare. When that didn't kill us off enough, they killed all the buffalo. So we starved to death. Then when that didn't work, they put us on reservations. We used to be in Fort Benton. That was our agency. They pushed us to Shoto. From Shoto, they pushed us what is called old agency. They pushed us here. If it wasn't for these mountains, they'd put us into Pacific Ocean. This is where we st it stopped. And this is what we're going to keep. We're going to fight for this area that we call our home. Imagine a landscape with soaring limestone peaks that come in waves and crash up against the Great Plains. And out of that springs this wonderful diversity of magnificent trees and animals and water. Language. Uh really waters down what you're feeling there. It's like, it's, a, it's so spiritual, it's like where, where Creator lives. Christian, Catholic, everybody else go into this house to pray. This is our house right here. All of our area, especially the mountain front, is safe to our people. They went in there, they camped, they hunted, they done things fast. It is a landscape that is so loaded with Blackfeet activity, with human activity, with the, with the souls of the, of the elders, with the ghosts of the elders. It's just always been intertwined in time and memorial. We've always had just a, we've been part of it. All of a sudden, somebody comes in there and wants to tear it up and rip it up. And, and <clears throat> for a few bucks, you know, I mean, it's like somebody, going to go, you know, do something to your family. 
You, you know, the question was, how do you feel about that? Well, obviously, you're going to defend it. Well, I found out about the initial leasing by a public meeting that was held at the community center in East Glacier. They were basically telling us, oh, we are here to get your comment. Uh, this isn't a done deal. And we knew they were lying to us. This thing was kind of sprung upon us <clears throat> all of a sudden. That's, at least that's the feeling we got. The leasing of the Badger to Medicine region was part of a large-scale mineral leasing campaign in the early days of the Reagan administration. During the Reagan-Watt years, everything was leased, including the Badger. It was nowhere safe. It was a kind of a slapdash approach and, oh well, what the heck, and, and the whole thing was just leased. When the leases were first issued, the United States government uh, did what's called a finding of no significant impact. The government in those early days took the position that signing a lease did not impact the environment and therefore did not require a significant environmental analysis because all a lease was was a piece of paper. They said, oh, we're not really out there doing anything yet. These other things can come later because we're just signing pieces of paper now. The problem with that reasoning was that the decision whether to allow drilling is made at the lease stage. After that, the government can regulate where on the lease the drilling will occur, on what conditions it will occur, but they cannot regulate whether it will occur. And actually, it's not legal to lease without taking that deeper look, and it's not legal to lease without looking at cultural resources, which they did not do. They are required by federal law, they were then, to consult with the Blackfeet tribe. We have reserved treaty rights on the Bad Virtue Medicine area. But in that time, there was no consultation with the Blackfeet. They just leased them. It's a manifest destiny. They felt that they have God-given right to come out here and just take, our, take it from us. When I'm in there hunting, I'm in there as a hunter, but at the same time, you know, you know you're in a very holy, sacred place. The feeling that you get when you're in there is almost like you are connected to that land. You are just like that tree, you are like that animal, you're a piece of that, of that uh, ecosystem where you're part of Creator. You are actually back in that time when you were just Peer, when you're as pure as the, the water, as pure as those trees, and as pure as those medicines that are out there. First of all, it's not hard to see the beauty in, in the place, you know, but it's more than that. And it's like if you look at a map and see where it sits in the ecosystem, you can see how valuable it is to the ecosystem of the whole. Out onto the prairie, up into the park, down the Rocky Mountain front, the Badger Two Medicine is the best the best habitat there is. What you don't see are this network of roads. You don't see a uh, you know, man's footprint on the land. It's this perfect transitional landscape that's uh, got flora and fauna that can support everything. What you see, what you smell, what you feel are the same things that any person standing there 10,000 years ago would have felt, seen, smelled the very same things. The mountains are kept pristine and sacred for a reason. That is the last refuge, the last cultural refuge of the Blackfeet. Around 1870 or 71, we became wards of the government. And a lot of our people were in the darkest times of their, of their lives, of our, our lives as a tribe. 
from 1890 until 1978. So for 88 years, it was against the law to practice any part of your religion. Anything dealing with your traditional culture, religion, ceremonies was, was on the list of Indian offenses. You could go to jail for that. Our mothers and fathers and our grandmothers and fathers were basically told, be an Indian's bad. Don't, you can't speak your language, you can't practice your religion, you can't take part in your ceremonies, you can't be an Indian. And during that time, the Badger to Medicine area became a place to practice ceremony. It's the only place they could go without being reprimanded or getting in trouble for practicing ceremony. That was the last refuge for just that freedom to be themselves, to be who they were. Our people are, have lost their, their cultural identity due to the reservation period. And those, being native was outlawed. Now it's not outlawed and our people are going back to it. And they're starting to get stronger and healthier. And this is a key component to our survival is the Badger to Met. Blackfeet find solace and healing in the Badger to Medicine. That's where they go. Where else are they gonna go? Some may, may go to church, but many others are going to the mountains. So to take that humanity and that spirituality away from the wilderness, away from the mountains, um, and replace it with something so alien as an oil well or a gas well. Um, something that is of no use to the community, particularly. No use to the community, no benefit to the community. Um, it's definitely going to take a lot away from here, a lot away. It's going to take a lot away from the, from the Blackfeet tribe. Everybody who lives along the front of the mountains has been involved, one way or the other. Everybody was telling us there's nothing you can do. A contract has been let to, uh, for the bulldozers to come and build the road. There was a lot of phone calls, outrage throughout our community. And we decided to uh, form some kind of group organization. We just decided that we had to do something. We spread the word and it became more and more known of the impacts that may happen. We did a big banner, put it on Main Street of East Glacier, 100 feet long. We literally set up camps and we covered all the roads. There were some even some demonstrations, I think, in Missoula with the Blackfeet working with these environmental groups. There was always a distrust with our people and non-tribal people to begin with is because of our history. But once they seen common ground and the potential to work together to protect a place that was important to everyone, regardless of where they came from, then that became the common ground. And when that energy went out, went out all over, and people have gravitated to help. Some, some of the lessees actually came and looked at the area and just said, you know, it, it, it's a disgrace to, to, to violate this area, rape this landscape, you know, and, and voluntarily relinquish their leases. But not every oil lease was retired. There were 17 remaining in the Badger Two Medicine, and an oil man from Louisiana, Sidney Longwell, kept pushing to develop his lease, and that led to his lawsuit. I'm William Perry Pendley, president of Mountain States Legal Foundation, a nonprofit public interest legal foundation in Lakewood, Colorado. The foundation's always looking for opportunities to, uh, uh, to protect property rights, and that's what this is all about. This is about a property right, the right to drill on a leasehold issued by the United States government. And our objective with every case, to the degree that we can, is to get to the Supreme Court of the United States and, and, and win a landmark ruling.
Mr. Longwell sued saying that the federal government had been delinquent in handling his lease. How long, how long, how long does someone have to wait for the government, not to say yes or no, but to make a decision, just simply make a decision? Give us your answer. Yeah, it's taken a while, but how long did it take the physical, the geological, the biological, the cosmic processes to produce this landscape? And for what purpose is their, is their mission? The odds of finding uh, much in the way of oil and gas are, are small. Even they've admitted that. This is not about gas. This, this, this is about running over us again. This is about taking, you know, manifest destiny. You know, how dare you, little redskins, you know. What if they say, well, all right, you just let us continue to have these leases. What is, the, to me, what, are they, what kind of a foothold are they trying to establish? I think it's a power game. They want to fight to the, to the end to, to set a precedent. If we drill in the Badger II medicine, we essentially have told the American people there is no place that's off limits. There is no place that's too special, too important, too valuable, and that places oil and gas development above all other uses, all other values. Basically, it says any place is open. Sidney Longwell's view is, uh, hey, we need energy. We need the ability to, to heat our homes and drive our cars and operate our systems, and I want to be part of that. If he finds natural gas and in the quantities that we're talking about, well, can't he bar the door? It's great news. It's great news for Mr. Longwell. It's great news for the local county. It's great news for, I think it's great news for the tribe. I think their lives would be vastly improved economically from this. When I was a young boy in my home, my father was a tribal leader, a nationally known Indian leader, but a tribal leader. And a lot of the real old, full-blood elders would come to my home just to visit. There was one old man in particular. He wasn't a political leader or anything. He just liked to come and visit. And before he would leave, almost every time, he would tell my dad, you know, Isla, I long for those long, happy times when we were poor, but we didn't know it. And I used to tell my dad, what does he mean? What does he mean? Finally, one day we had a discussion about it. And he said, well, do you think he means that that was a time when they didn't want anything? And the light bulb kind of went off in my head. That, that our people of that time Happiness was just what I had today. I have enough today to take care of my family and myself, and I'm happy. And one day someone come along in a non-Indian world and said, oh, look at you Blackfeet, look how poor you are, look how you live. Look at these people down there, look what they got. That's the way you should live. And we started wanting what other people had instead of being happy with what we had. And, and when we started wanting that, we weren't happy anymore. So when we can quit wanting those things and the money that comes from oil and gas and oil and gas development, maybe we'll start being happy again. went all the way over to fight in Iraq and I come back here and I'm fighting the same battle. My home is being attacked. This is my Vatican. As a county commissioner, we realize the possible benefits from development through revenue. But in spite of that, as a county commission, we are opposed to the development of this site. The words, this land is sacred, are just words. You need to go there to understand it. This land is our past, our future. It gives us life, and it is vital in the continuation of Blackfeet identity. 
We ask you humbly to open your hearts and your minds and free your spirits and see the land as we see it and understand it as we see it and understand it's a place that has to be preserved. The effort to stop oil and gas drilling in the Badger II medicine is important. But it's about more than that. It's about perpetuity. It's about protecting the Badger II medicine forever. And in many ways, the voices of the Blackfeet are the most important voices in that effort. Knowing what we know now, looking back through the lens of history at what a crushing blow, blow after blow after blow, to that culture and then say, oh, just sit tight, we're just gonna do it again a little bit. It's insane, it's like the least we could do, the very least, to begin to atone for what we've stripped from the Blackfeet and other indigenous cultures. The least we can do is protect those sacred lands. It's an ironic point that the initial encounter with the Americans was the, the incident at the Badger Two Medicine River back in 1806. That was the first conflict incident. And here, this latest conflict incident has awakened us to the peril that this landscape is in, in an unprotected state. The Badger issue has been a way for our community just to move forward together and it united a lot of people. It's just not this trend where, yeah, we fight and we got the leases canceled. It's not like that. You know, I've been involved just in this year. You know, I'm already thinking the future of the Badger Tree Medicine and I know other people of my generation, and you know, everyone is thinking about the future of the Badger Tree Medicine. We, at this point in time, have the ability to speak and, and indeed have the moral responsibility to speak for future generations, speaking for the unborn of all species. Who is going to protect that land if we don't? 